Cashamaniacs. Welcome to episode 287 of the Geo Gearheads, and we're back for another randomized show. And you know what? This is Chris of the Northwest's favorite type of show. Oh, you better believe it. I love the randomized show. You know, it's kind of like me. My thoughts are random and scattered, and so are the topics. But speaking of random and scattered, we have a guest with us tonight. He's actually I, probably less random and scattered than I am. I, I was going to say, are you calling <laughs> Gary random and scattered? I don't know. I think that's probably appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, He's on random shows and scattered all over the internet, I guess. Oh, there you go. Yeah. That, I guess that works. That's Gary, good welcome to the podcast. For, yeah. For anyone who doesn't know, Gary is the host of the Geocache Talk, uh, Geocache Talk podcast as I trip over my own tongue. It's okay. Yes. I was glad to be here with you guys. Well, it's uh, nice that you were able to uh, join us on uh, short notice. Uh, and I'm going to uh, uh, do one quick uh, note before we actually really get into the topics, because we got a ton of topics. And that's episode five of the Inside Geocaching HQ podcast. Had some interesting insight that just came out this last week. Uh, and it was questions from the geocaching media. They used three of the questions that I asked in there. I, I think I submitted like seven. I don't remember, but they only used three. I knew they weren't going to use all of them because, well, that would be like an entire show. Uh, but the most interesting one was about the uh, headquarters, uh, you know, the geocaching.com recovery plans. And you might remember that the last, maybe it was two randomized shows ago, uh, we talked a little bit about, you know, what they might have in place because someone had asked about, uh, you know, could they rebuild from Project GC and GSAC? Well, they actually talked about it for real. And I think that's the first time I've recalled hearing anything about their infrastructure in years. I think at least since they started talking about the uh, uh, server, or since they started talking about the server upgrades, which were shortly after they had that uh, data center fire. Boy, that seems like a long time ago now. I know. That's just because well, I'm it old. Is. It is. I mean, that, that was like in the days of the original... Uh, Cashamaniacs podcast, which was like f at least uh, five years ago. I want to say that was like closer to t a decade ago now. And it was over the 4th of July weekend, correct? The weekend we're coming up on right now. I it's think so. I think so. I think it was actually like a couple of days before the 4th of July weekend. It could have been a couple of days after. But yeah, it, it wreaked havoc. And it was uh, shortly after people actually started using uh, the API and the uh, uh, apps and stuff like that. So I don't think it was quite 10 years ago. Okay. But that was part of the thing was that uh, the apps, you know, the, the, well, I think at that point it was just the iPhone app. I was going to say the app. Yeah. Yeah. It was completely useless because it couldn't talk to the surfers. Right. <laughs> what coaster says he thought they backed up into uh, five and a quarter floppies and mailed them away to offsite backup. No, they put them on, they, they magneted them to a, file cabinet and stored them there uh it, it, you know, the sad thing is probably half of our audience doesn't know what the problem is with that plan That's true. <laughs> hey I, I want to defend myself talking about okay. uh random and scattered susan slinkard that would be gary's mm. wife That's says right. it's appropriate to call you random and scattered yes <clears throat> well That's as long me. as we have permission from her then everything's exactly. good exactly exactly Susan, thanks. Give us any other tidbits we can use against Gary. <laughs> All right, Gary, since you are so random and scattered, uh, why don't you do the uh, reminders on the upcoming events? Yes, I will. Uh, Canada events are this week, uh, actually uh, to this weekend. So uh, Friday and Saturday. No, no Saturday, Saturday and Sunday. Sunday. That's right. Um, get a souvenir and enjoy the canada day uh 150 years i think right exactly the sesquicentennial there you go Ooh, that's good you can thank wits and for that he, <laughs> he coached <me. laughs> i noticed that uh geopaul 
over in London, they're going to an, a Canada Day event. So it's going to be an international weekend. Everybody's going to go to a Canada Day event. So that's pretty cool. And then uh wanted to mention about the Mary Hyde events on July 15th uh, weekend, I think. You can get one uh, souvenir either day. Ours is July 15th, but uh, – if you're going to host an event, you got the deadline is is now, so you need to get your uh, event um, put in so it can be published in time. If you have not yet, your deadline is upon you. And, See, and I'm uh, going to do a uh, Midwest Geo Bash for that one, so I don't have to worry about it. Oh, very good. Yeah. Well, and they have the I can't remember what it is at this point. I should have looked it up, but totally forgot to. Uh, uh, do so. Uh, there's some like hot sauce or something that's uh, doing events in like a dozen different cities around the country. Do you Ooh. remember that one at all? No. So, sounds good. <sighs> Are we thinking like as hot sauce? When you say hot sauce, like Tabasco or sriracha? Yeah, it, it's not Tabasco or sriracha, okay. but 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 I that's what you mean when you say hot sauce. Yes. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Uh, let me see if I can find this. Well, Daryl, you're close enough to Canada. Are you going to go to a Canada Day event in Canada? Oh, I wish I could, but I can't because I don't have the seven or eight hours to get back through customs. Um, oh, wow. Wow. You it, need it's generally card. not that bad, but it's seriously that it, like right now you're seriously looking at two, three hours to get back wow. across to the u.s what so it, it's not an option right now I, it, it's the holiday we're heading up on both sides we're heading up tomorrow um to canada to canada yes because ah. you know why not celebrate a canadian a canada day event in canada sure and uh, it's all about you know maple syrup and poutine and uh tim horton tim hortons thank you i think that that's it that's the three things i can mention about canada tim and <laughs> <laughs> gotta have a tip. Gotta have a Tim bit. Gotta have a Tim. Right, bit. Shermanator eighteen beat me to the punch. It's Captain Rodney's, and they're doing the uh, Captain Rod Rodney's Great American Treasure Hunt. So for me, I'm going to the one in Dearborn on the sixteenth. Uh, uh, is that geocaching Which, related or just is. outdoor? Is it? How, how did yeah, I miss this? Yeah, they had a, a big thing about it. Uh, it is GC seven five. 9F1 for anyone who wants to look that up. But uh, they are going to be giving away uh, trackables, unactivated trackables at the events. So there's there's like dozens of these events, if I remember, around the country. I think it is only in the U.S. Because they have to uh, inconvenience everyone else. Don't tell them, uh, Keith. He'll be angry. Shermanator 18 says she's going to the one in Albany on the 23rd. Cool. Ooh, which is hosted by Monkey... Oh, no, no, no. The one here is, I guess, lo uh, uh, done by Monkey Brad. So that should be really good. Oh, Captain Brad, Ronnie's yeah. Authentic Flavor. Private Reserve. But oh. there is a link on that uh, GC number, so I'll put this in the uh, show notes for the uh, uh, page at geocaching.com for the trackables. Trackables. Our business is making great all-natural foods. Our play is geocaching. Join us on our adventure, hashtag geocaching with Captain Rodney's hashtag contest. And there's... Uh, their own events that they're hosting uh, looks like kind of just in the Midwest. Oh, no, no, no. Yep, it is all over the U.S. So we'll put a link to this in the uh, uh, show notes. And anyone who hasn't caught it can check it out and see if there's an event coming up near them. Love it. All right. So let's move into emails. And yes. yeah, yeah, well, it's easy to get distracted. And, you know, we're getting good at getting distracted. What? I'm sorry, I wasn't listening. You know, <laughs> I I swear I would not be anywhere near as distracted if it weren't, you know, I, I was at work, uh, let's see, about 17 hours ago, 
Mm. So, you know, <laughs> this gets a little late and lately I've been getting exhausted. But Gary, <laughs> you wanted to read the uh, first of our emails. So why don't we leave you to uh, R. Reagan's email? I will. R. Reagan <clears throat> wrote, as often as I often do, I listen to the show in the car on the way to a geocaching event. The part about trip planning with spreadsheets and timing the stops was interesting as this is a problem I tackled on my eight day Midwest geocaching road trip in the spring. Let me detail my list construction process. <clears throat> First, determine list of highest favorites in a state, list of oldest in a state, challenge caches, virtuals and webcams, list of needed DT combos. A goal of this trip was to finish the second fizzy loop. Ooh, good for you. Highlighted entries in all of these lists so they would stand out in the next step. Then adding all of these lists to my map view in Geosphere, and there's a note that says doable and cashly, but currently you would need to physically merge the lists. Then set the map view window on the road at the start of the journey, zoomed in to be around a mile wide view. Do a quote, find caches in map view, unquote. Any highlighted caches in the view were put on the chosen list and any cache at any easy on off interstate exit was added, but only one per county and a backup for that county. Then drag the map along the road to the next area in small plane flying. This is called going IFR. I follow roads. <laughs> the ca the caches along a route just doesn't do it for me. This process lets me cherry pick. Once I've assembled a list for a day of the trip, I ran a Perl script to convert the resulting GPX to a CSV. Although I think you can do it via Project GC, you can, if you put the cache list into the virtual GPS. CSV file with column headings of address name, lat long, notes, duration, and then holding the GC code, cache name, lat long and decimal degrees, notes, holding other info I wanted such as reasons for getting it, duration for how long I expect to spend at the cache. This file was now inputted into the trip planning website. Furcot? Is that right, That's Harold? as good a uh, guess as any. I think that's what yeah. we've been calling it. F-U-R-K-O-T, furcot.com. To think, create the trip uh, planning. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Jesse uh, Shirtynitz had been calling it fur coat. Fur coat. Okay, I'll, we'll go with Shorty. Shorty needs, knows better than us. She's she's a really good planner. To create the trip plan for the day, a set a settable default time at each cache is used, and the CSV file can override that for ones that would take longer. I had the caches in the desired route order, so I turned off the feature that plans the minimum minimal route for you. Could be very handy though. You get a map of the route, arrival time, and departure time for each cache plus driving time from cache to cache based on Google Map computations, not how the crow flies. Very important. You can then export the plan as a CSV file and message it further, oh, massage it further in Google Sheets. I, get, I see what she's saying, or he. I don't know if they're male or female. Excel or whatever suits you. This works well for me, and it would have worked better had I factored in time for a lunch stop. But who needs to eat when there are caches to be found and miles to drive? Well, I didn't stay 100% on schedule. Each day ran about an hour over. It was remarkably handy. For what she's talking about, or he, is, I don't know if it's... It, it's either, rich, so it's a he. It's a he. Okay, so what he's doing, um, for as much as he was doing... That's pretty good if he was only an hour over, in my opinion. That's pretty good. Especially without food stops. I assume that means no food, no gas, no restroom stops scheduled. Maybe. He probably, right. He probably forgot to put those in, but that's a lot of planning. I mean, that's really Oh, cool. yeah. And, cool. Well, my whole point is if he forgot to put those in and he's only an hour over, that's right. incredible. That's pretty incredible. Oh, exactly. So Yeah, I'm sure some of that is uh, just uh, intuition. But, you know, you, you do enough of these and you definitely get a feel for it. Mm -hmm. But it is rough if you don't have a set schedule if you're trying to do 
you know, these caches. You know, and Chris, uh, we went through some of that when uh, we were on our way to uh, Geo Woodstock uh, 13, right? 13? Nine. No, it wasn't that late or early, was it? Pennsylvania. Thir- 13 oh, no, was no, no, in no. Washington, D.C. Um, 13, so 12 maybe? It was the one in uh, St. Louis. 12. But in any case, anyway. 12? Okay. Yeah, we, we had a uh, plan. When, you know, I did the same kind of thing where it's you know, here's there. our time. I he like is? how you say we had a plan. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Daryl had Fine. a plan. I had the plan. It was my job to get the plan as we drove along. Right. <laughs> we had a plan document. There you go. <laughs> no. Daryl had the plan, and Chris had the way to thwart the plan. That was the yeah. plan. <laughs> um, well, we had uh, an event that we wanted to be at by a certain time. Right. Mm-hmm. And that was our whole thing. And we made it. Just barely, but we made it. <laughs> exactly. Um, and Daryl, I mean, you picked some great caches to go on on that uh, on that route. And of course, you know, we had to make sure we hit at least one cache in every state to verify that we had that state. So, yeah, there yep. was a there was a lot of good planning in there. Yeah, and we had the uh, primary and secondary caches just in case. A lot of times we had more than two caches, but a tertiary cache. Yeah, yeah exactly. Ooh. Tertiary. Yeah, you have to tertiary. have those. But it, I looked for those uh, like rest areas where you had more than one. I think we had one rest area with three caches in it. Mm-hmm. Those are now, always awesome. Now, Daryl, this plan that R. Reagan has here, could you modify this in the sense that could you pull this into another, like you have another route planning that other than fur coat that, that, you've, that you use, correct? Well, for, yeah, fur coat does a lot more uh, as far as like the stop uh, times and stuff. Okay, but I use uh, uh, Navigon, right? So that it it's the actual navigation in the car. Could you take a CSV file and do something similar? I, mm-hmm. I don't think you can do a CSV with uh, Navigon. Okay, well, uh, I think you can do something with CSV and um, uh, Google Earth. And a lot of people do Google Earth, and Google Earth, if I remember, will transfer your routes to the Google Maps so that you can pull them up on the phone and use it for yeah. navigation there. Perfect. But that's one of my big things is I really want the navigation on the uh, phone mm-hmm. or, you know, iPad or whatever, because a lot of times people will take the iPad and that is their, you know, the uh, Nexus 7 was great for that, but that because that's like your car GPS. It's a good right. size for that. Yeah. I just did some trip planning and I could not get what I wanted out of, out of fur coat. So I ended up using uh, Microsoft map point, which is kind of the successor to streets and trips. Mm-hmm. Um, it will import a GPX file, but it doesn't make those stops. It just like makes those points of interest. So the GPX file wasn't what I was looking for. Um, I ended up having to, you know, take it into a notepad type one and, and clear out everything but the coordinates and the GC code so that I had something quick and easy to work with. Uh, sure, yeah. Once I had it in there, then I could say, here, here's my route, plan it for me. Or here's my stops, plan my route. And, you know, at each stop include, I think I gave 15 minutes. And, you know, every three hours stop for 20 minutes because you're going to need fuel and such. You're All going right. to need input and output. Talking about uh, stopping, I think we need to uh, stop with this one and move on because otherwise we're not going to get through all this stuff. We have to stop stopping. So, Gary, uh, you grabbed this uh, next one from your uh, co-host on uh, Geocache Talk. I did. Do I have to read this one? Is she... I mean, she she's listen? in the chat, so I she's guess you have to chat. read it. Is she listening? Okay, all right. No, if, and if she didn't have a broken internet connection, she she hasn't found all the leaks and taped them up yet. Right. Uh, she'd probably be on the show to read it herself. There you go. Well, I heard she'll be on soon. So uh, here was her email. And um, I won't point out all of her punctuation issues, but anyway. I listened to this logging show after the fact and wanted to write in about how I log caches. Sorry in advance for the long email. There are many different ways I I lost caches, and I think she means log, and they really depend on what the cache situation is. I have a small template in Cachely, 
Yay, Cashly. 3.0 is out now. That I use for every cache I find. And if I am out finding numerous caches, I may write a sentence or two about who I'm with and what we're doing for that day, which I think is great. You got to put something. If I am out on a trail or in a park doing numerous caches. I usually mark them as found in Cashly. I occasionally add a few details about the hide to help me remember or add notes about the condition of the cache while it was wet, etc. I usually use my GPSR for navigating on longer caching days, but really hate trying to type up any semblance of a log on the GPSR. Boy, yeah. After the day is over, I have a list of pending logs in Cashly I will email this list to myself as a text file so that I can use it to log my finds on the computer and also give to my boyfriend so he can log the caches on his, his account. They, he never keeps track of them himself. <laughs> makes makes Sydney do it. If there are over a handful of logs to post, I usually import the text file into GSAC to publish them. If there are only a few finds, I import the text file into the drafts function on geocaching.com. If I'm out by myself or just finding one or two caches, I write up my log on my phone using Cachely and publish them for the app. There is one instance where I will use only Cachely to publish a log. That is for a needs maintenance or needs archived log. I don't like how geocaching.com has changed that at all. I like to add specific details to these logs about why the cache needs maintenance or should be archived instead of having the details in a separate in in a separate found DNF or write note log. Okay, got it, yeah. Cashly still lets you write a needs maintenance log without the canned response that geocaching.com has now. Very good, Sydney. Now, I, I really can relate to this whole thing about the significant other not wanting to do the logging. <laughs> right. Renee has at least 50 caches from one trip that she still hasn't logged. Oh. <laughs> but I'll send her the field notes and they just sit in her email because she just doesn't get around to it. And she just doesn't like that part of the game. There are people like that. My, my, my son finds caches all the time and he just never logs them. I mean, he'll, he'll log them when he's with, when he's with us, but normally he just doesn't log them. And then I have another friend who he just, yeah, he just completely forgets about it, but to each his own, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, the thing that I really want to play with more, and I have yet to really uh, wrap my hand, head around it, is looking for cash because that does allow you to log in with multiple accounts and do the posting to all of the accounts. But it's it's not as intuitive to me as I would like, and therefore is, I just don't use it. Is that an Android? That's an iOS app. That's iOS. Yeah. Okay. Looking for cash. Yeah. I remember, yeah. I remember you mentioned that And that, that was, before. until Cashly came along, the leading contender to replace uh, Geosphere. And for anyone who doesn't know, Geosphere, and it, we've talked about it before, so you should know, Geosphere is going to stop working with iOS 11. Ooh. So if you have a phone that updates to iOS 11, you're not going to be able to use Geosphere anymore. So anything you want, make sure to get it out before the update. Now, for those who are still on like the iPhone 4s and 4Ss, and we do have a surprising number of people still on those devices, they can't be updated, so you don't have to worry about it and you're stuck with like, you know, Geosphere because the newer apps just don't work. You know, they need the newer. Get to use. Well, yes, but if you wanted to use right. Cashly, you can't because it uses or it needs some of those newer features in the newer versions of the OS. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to uh, what coasters email. And he says, maybe I'm late to the party as normal, but I just wanted to tell you that geochecker.com looks to have changed their format on the website. I find it easy to use like, and like the format checking that goes on as I enter coordinates. I wish I didn't have to select check coordinates twice once I'm finished, but it's a small thing. And Gary, you actually found some more info on that. I did. And um, I did some interesting looking at, because uh, I hadn't looked at the checkers for a few months. And uh, there are some interesting things that uh, I was not aware of. 
You can create new secret code links up to 64 characters. It's not limited to coordinates, obviously. Customize your GeoCheckered link solution success page with a custom image, a link. I, I knew about that one, but that's a cool, cool feature. Customize you found it, your found it text. Uh, I think all these are um, premium or paid. Uh, if you uh, are on there, no, no third-party banner advertisements when you use it. Um, several things provide unique tokens to cash seekers. And the one I really liked was this: uh, <clears throat> your geo checkered links include a help me link for G check for cash seekers to easily connect to your geocache.com profile. So mm -hmm. there are some cool things, and then there's geo checker plus link stats are more detailed save for longer than the basic owner stats and you can automatically have the geochecker plus registration of puzzles for your own caches so interesting um the different things that they they have and you know <clears throat> I, I well i don't know what you guys use for your for puzzle caches when you're creating caches i used events <laughs> for a, a long time and uh, of course yes you're out of now, <laughs> now now it's no good so um, i know um jennifer always mentions geo checker and geo check um yeah i think uh, i'm on geo checker but i'd have to go and look again because mm -hmm. i honestly don't even remember i like geo checker i think that i've got uh i do have one puzzle i need to fix uh because i went and looked i thought i thought i fixed this this one, of course, I pulled it up before the show, and it's like, nope, it was an event, so it's broken. So I gotta go fix that one. But oh. uh, yeah, you know, I do like these kind of services that have the free model for or the free level for anyone to really use it, and then all of the extra features for the paid because it does give uh, you a way to uh, pay to keep that service running because these things are not free, right? They they might not cost a lot to actually maintain. But it isn't free, and they're not a lot. Of I mean, <clears throat> Project GC, uh, thirty bucks a year. I mean, it's it's well worth it. The the tools you can get. Uh, I do not know off the top of my head GSAC, which we're going to talk about here in a minute. But GSAC probably is thirty bucks a, a year too. I I haven't looked, but you get the idea. Uh, you know, it's <clears throat> more than well worth. Uh, it's, it's cheap to get really good tools, and you know. Uh, it, they're they're worth us being patrons of these different programs because like you said they're not free these people aren't i mean they are providing us with some free items but we need to you know let's open up our wallets geo geocachers you know pry that thing loose and give them a few dollars good grief come on people yeah it does cost money to keep it running and we want to make sure the service is running so let's toss some money their way that said, I don't pay for any of my checkers right now because I just don't use checkers that much. But for those that do. Exactly, exactly. All right, so let's move on to a blast from the past that comes via Limax's email. In my searching for uh, conversion tools and GPSR tools on the web, one item keeps popping up, and that's expert GPS. I have to say the website looks pretty, and it seems to do a lot of things that I'd find useful. However, the price tag, $65 for the home version, keeps me from trying it. Have either of you investigated it or taken the plunge on it? And this is one of those tools that kept coming up in the early days for me. I, was I have say, I remember, never oh, touched it. Oh, no, yeah, no. I'm I just, downloaded I've the never free touched trial it. at one time. Uh, yes, actually, I do remember the free trial and I remember being puzzled by it. Yes, I, I walked away going, huh, uh, I don't think this is for me. Well, it's a lot of overkill for what most cashers at the time needed, which was something to just basically load their uh, cords into the uh, GPS in the days where it was a serial, you a serial connection you couldn't just drag and drop. So if that's all you needed, something like that didn't cut it. You know, it was just, or I shouldn't say cut it, but something like that was so much overkill. But I, I want to say at that point, it was only like 30 bucks. It might have been. Inflation has kicked in. Um, but it will do a lot more than what geocachers need. I look at, I, I look at it more as a GIS tool. 
than a GPX tool. Does that make sense? Yes, and I think you're probably right about that. Or I guess a new term for it is GNSS, which I'm not sure what that means. I just keep seeing that as the new term for uh, global location service stuffs. Hmm. I was going to say, don't we have a uh, patron with those letters? GNSS? Yeah. Uh, global Navigation Satellite System. Oh, is that what it stands for? Yeah. Okay. Genies. I think it's yeah. pronounced nice. But, uh, oh, Gene. Yes, yes, yes. That's Gene Nice. Gene. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, he's a patron anymore or not. I can't remember. In any case, that yeah, that's uh, the GNSS covers all of the various satellite systems. With If we have time, we're going to talk about some of those. But because there's so many of those out there now, they've uh, switched to calling them GNSSs. Mm-hmm. Still Actually, refer- that's probably not true. G- GNSS. GNSS. No, they call it GNSSs, at least on the one I'm GNSSI. looking at. But, oh, okay. Because you got Navstar, you got GLONASS, you got... So you're right. They're now... The generic term is GNSSs. Yes. <laughs> and, and they're talking about, you know, the GNSS services and uh, software, and it's like, ay, ay, ay. So I'm, I'm well familiar with the term. I just don't really know what it means or stands for. I never bothered to look it up because I know... You know, it's in context. They knew what it was, kind of like GPS. How many people really know what GPS stands for? A lot of people think that last S is satellite. Going place somewhere. Going places somewhere. And a lot of people refer to their GPS R as a GPS. Going to play something? (laughs) Going to play something. There you go. All right, so let's move on to the GSAC question, Chris. This one comes from Wooden Radio. He sent it in via email. Thank you, Wooden Radio. One question for about GSAC logging. Each type of log allows only one template, but in the template, there are five special templates. So let's say you're on a day long cache run. There are some you find in one minute, some take five minutes, and some take half an hour. Just half an hour, really? I usually find ones that are longer than that. Uh, well, I make it longer than that, but he goes on to say, I'd like to set up three I found it templates. One saying, the find was darned easy. It took a while to make the find. Boy, this one was difficult, but I finally located the cache. These are, of course, all found caches. There are special templates, and and there are special templates. So question, how can I take advantage of the special templates and actually make sense of using them? I may not want to use the same found template for every cache. It looks like there's no way to get uh, to the specials. That's my only gripe about GSAC. Well, of course, I had to email uh, Starcasher this question and see if he had any insights since he's our uh, logging expert through GSAC. And I'm going to try to do this justice, but it's not going to work very well. So, you know, if you really want to look into it, I'm sure there's uh, information on the uh, forums. But his email basically reads, I personally have never used the special templates, but I just read the help screens, which are extremely well done in GSAC. And it appears that they can be triggered by setting the conditions you want uh, them to apply, and they will override the log type based on the default templates. The condition needs to be any combination of these seven items. Publish logs, uh, sequence sequence number range, uh, cache name contains certain string, log type, field node contains certain string, date range of log, GC account name GSAC is currently running under or the type of cache. So to do what you want, you have to come up with three unique strings you can place in the field notes on the GPSR for each find. Let's say they are easy, medium, hard for the three conditions, or maybe using a special character and letter combination like dollar sign $E, dollar sign $M, dollar sign $H whatever makes sense and would not be used anywhere in the field notes when not intended. Then the special one template would be, uh, we're going to leave out the control kind of characters here. Yeah. Curly brackets, Uh, log type equals found it. Uh, Field date contains easy. The find was darn easy. Special two would be log type equals found it. Field note contains medium. It took a long time to, uh, it, it took a while to make this find. And then the third template would be 
Log type equals found it. Field note contains hard. Boy, this one was difficult, but finally located the cache. Then any found it log with a field note containing the words easy, medium, or hard would get the appropriate special template and any other would get the default found it template. Note that the conditions are the uh, braces uh, do exclude from the actual log and he tested it and it does work. So for something like that, you could set it up, you know, if you're caching with a group, who actually found that cache? Perhaps Daryl found it or Gary found it. It would never be Chris of the Northwest. But, That's not um, true. That's not true. I mean, you know, as we say down here, even a blind hog finds an acorn once in a while. Well, that's true. When everybody well, else is looking in the wrong spot, the only spot left if is I'm, the right one. Yeah, if I'm finding it, or if I'm understanding that correctly, and I might not be, it sounds like those special logs are essentially mail merge type of functions. It, it seems so, that way. Well, yeah, so you could probably do like dollar sign cashier name, and it would just insert that name. So oh, you could do, I, I, right, and right. I could be wrong that it's not doing multiples, but the way I read that, it seems like it's going to do multiples. So you could do like a mm -hmm. dollar sign cash with, and then put those in. Right. But as soon as it sees that, it's going to stop using your default log. Which would be okay if you're doing something like this. Then you yes, might be able to, absolutely. right. And then log type is one of them. You, you probably could look through the list of options um, log type equals found it. You probably could come up with another parameter for something like found it and then have a width and then a name of some kind. So yeah, you probably could, you'd make a parameter for every person you were with. Is that what you're thinking, Daryl? You could do like, exactly. Yeah. You know, all of your common, uh, caching buddies, put them in there and then you can go and uh, drop them in there. So you could even say like, uh, you know, I found this with dollar sign caching name and mm -hmm. the whole, the whole thing behind why I would want to do that is so that you could do then the, uh, um, uh, markdown language, uh, mm -hmm. so that you can link to the, uh, name and everything. Cause I really do appreciate that. So I can click on the link and go to that cashers profile. I agree. You know, and maybe I'm contact go, them. I'm going to go put a dollar sign in my caching name right now just to throw you off <laughs> oh. that would be bad <laughs> can, can you put you're, a dollar starting to the bad cop oh sorry <laughs> sorry let me go back to chris of the northwest can you put a dollar sign in part of your name of your geocaching name i Does don't know you? no i don't know what special characters are allowed <laughs> yeah i'll have to look that up go ahead move on all right keep going i'm, I'm gonna uh, throw in another little indulgent thing here and that's uh the Zillow news that's been all over the place this week. And this really got me steamed for, I'm not going to go into it too much, but for anyone who hasn't heard the story, Zillow uh, did a cease and desist to a blogger using photos that had also been published to the Zillow site, trying to take down the entire blog, not just the photos that they claim they had copyright to. And this was such a, an unbelievable overreach and there's no possible way that this was anything close to being valid that a bunch of different organizations uh, jumped to the aid of uh, Katie Wagner who's the uh, author of the McMansion Hell blog so Have they've you... dropped this lawsuit they've dropped the whole thing and it's done but it, it's really a nasty situation and it prompted me and a bunch of other people I know to instantly delete their uh, Zillow accounts over it because we want nothing to do with someone who's abusing the copyright system this badly. I, I like the McMansion, uh, McMansion hell blog simply because, you know, it just shows the audacity, the, um, the overabundance uh, uh, of what they're trying to accomplish through architecture to make a standard house look like a, a mansion. And it was hilarious. Yeah, so. it, it's, and it's totally from what I am understanding fair use, which they're claiming in their cease and desist letter that it's not, they don't have copyright on the photos. So they're 
claiming that they did. And it's just insane that they thought that this was uh, in any way, shape, or form acceptable. Mm -hmm. And it's just really to bully someone to take down their uh, blog. Right. So, yeah, this is a gross overreach, and I'm glad that they were scolded for it as publicly as they were. Uh, And hopefully people who are at all interested in it will go and check out the uh, link in the show notes to the uh, uh, Verge article that was just released today. So I'm thankful that this is over, and hopefully other companies will learn that you you can't do that. Yeah, now you can't take your power and bully somebody into doing what you want them to do. Well, it's the same old thing where copyright really only works for the big corporations because they can take their uh, lawyers that they have on staff or on retainer anyway and just throw them at people. And, you know, us little bloggers, podcasters, YouTube creators, and YouTube is really bad about this kind of stuff because all it has to happen is you get a uh, um, copyright. uh, I forget what the engine is, but the engine... Mm-hmm. thinks that you have a bit of some other copyrighted material in there and it just pulls it down and then you have to appeal and go through all that. It, you know, at least there's an appeal process, but it really has gotten to be very, very troublesome. Exactly. exactly. Now on a happier note, we did uh, get some good news. I think at least from uh, Apple during the WWCC and that is the new AR kit for iOS. And anyone who doesn't know, this is augmented reality. And what I I found interesting about this... No, no, no. It doesn't turn your phone into a pirate. That's that's actually in the new Siri stuff with their language translation. Mm. That's the R kit. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) exactly. There you go. There's a couple more R's in there. Uh, But in a nutshell, this is not something that we as users of iOS are going to directly access, but it's a uh, a toolkit that the programmers can use to easily drop in AR stuff. And this is really interesting because it's doing fairly accurate with one camera, just the camera on the back of the cam on the back of the phone, really accurate measurements. A lot of the early test uh, apps coming from the developers using ARKit are things like virtual rulers to measure the distance between two points in your photo. Oh, well, in, not in your photo, but in your live view. Yeah, that's cool. You know, and ultimately this is to build things that interact with the real world in real time. And with one camera, they're able to do what Google was doing with project tango and, you know, Microsoft's working on this kind of stuff with HoloLens. You've got a lot of the uh, uh, VR headsets trying to do the same kind of uh, real world mapping. But Apple's got this technology going and I'm pretty sure I remember hearing something about it as one of the companies that they uh, purchased and shut down before they actually came out with anything. And don't forget, they've, they also acquired the uh, company that made the original Connect for Microsoft. Mm-hmm. So they, they've been working on this stuff for a long time. They've been acquiring a lot of companies. What they've come out with really seems amazing. And I'm very anxious to see this in the real world. You know, I, I like even the concept of uh, like Ikea, for instance, using the AR kit to let you build the furniture in your room, build the floor plan, and think about what you could conceivably even do for like a kitchen remodel with putting the cabinets in and you know, you could do it certainly with like tango or something like that too, but to have it just on your standard phone that you don't have to go out and spend, you know, a fortune getting the special phone that has multiple cameras in it is really, I think going to be a game changer and it could lead to, you know, project tango has really been working toward that indoor mapping. So I think we're going to see a lot more, good uh, uh, location services working inside, but they're based on visuals. So that's not going to be something that we're going to use for caching. It could be very cool for like games though. I I guess to an extent uh, is used for like Pokemon go to. 
Right. Well, in, in Pokemon Go is a very simple AR. Imagine what's going to happen when they get their hands on like this kind of stuff where you get better mapping of the real world. Right. And this is going to open up a whole new level of games like uh, Pokemon Go and we'll talk about it in a little bit. Uh, yeah. Garfield. Uh, Garfield Go, which <laughs> I'm still trying to wrap my head around that one. <laughs> Garfield, stop. Yes, stop. <laughs> just just stop. All right. Uh, Speaking of GNSSs earlier, though, Chris, take us to the next article. Well, you know, GPS World has said two more satellites join the, const- the uh, Galileo constellation. The 15th and 16th satellites are the first edition of the working constellation since the start of Galileo, uh, December 15th. These were launched, both of them, on November 17th, 2016. Their navigation uh, and search and rescue payloads have had to be switched on, checked, and performance, uh, had to have the performance checked of different Galileo s- signals uh, before they were put in service with the rest of the system. So that's good news. We've got two more uh, Galileo uh, satellites up there, and we're getting the uh, system built out. Little by little. And the next story from uh, GPS World is that a contract has been signed with uh, OHB and SSTL for eight more satellites. So it's a consortium that's doing this, and it's the uh, third of the uh, satellite signings. So there was uh, one for... uh, uh, four to orbital validation satellites uh, built by a consortium le- by Airbus and uh, Airbus Defense and Space, while production of the next 22 fully operational capable uh, satellites uh, was uh, done by this other group. So no mention in the article was made of the timetable to have these uh, next eight operational, though. My guess, probably several more years. And that's just a guess. You never know. Yep. But remember, none of the equipment we have currently in our hands supports Galileo, though I think I remember seeing on some of the new phones that were coming out this year, support for Galileo. So this is not stuff that's going to help you anytime in the near future. You'll probably have to replace your hardware to be able to use it. Well, now, you know, we need that new Garmin GPS. But if you're going to buy it, make sure it has GPS-3 satellite capability because the second GPS-3 satellite is assembled and ready for testing. Lockheed Martin is in full production behind uh, GPS-3, the world's most powerful GPS satellite, according to the company. They've uh, launched their second one, or their second one is assembled and preparing for environmental testing. Which, Daryl, how do you test for the vacuum of space <laughs> here on Earth? I, I'm assuming you could probably actually do that. Put it into a room, suck all the air out, maybe even chill it. I don't know. You chill certainly out. can't do it for uh, zero Kelvin. Right. Can you? Well, maybe you can. I don't know. I don't know. Or test, for the, test for the radiation. It's going to get exposed. And micrometeorites. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they're going to... Uh, uh, <laughs> Pelt it with the ball bearings just to make space, sure. Space junk, yeah. Hit it with shotgun, space junk. yeah. Hey, we'll, yeah. we'll withstand the shotgun shell. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. No, it doesn't. Uh, back to the drawing board. Oh, um, geez. The third satellite. So currently we're using GPS 2F. So GPS 3 is the next step in that. And the third satellite is close behind having re- just received its navigation payload. Yeah, now the cool thing about this article was the photos because they did have some awesome photos of the assembly, including guys standing in the like shell of the satellites, loading it up with all the electronics. That was pretty cool. Yeah. But yeah, this is going to be just the next generation of uh, GPS satellites. You know, we've been launching the two Fs, which is essentially the you know, next generation of the twos and the threes are completely new design that are going to give us a lot better uh, performance all the way around, including they're supposed to improve accuracy, even for those of us using old GPSRs. So I'm excited. And they can use the old, 
right, Daryl? Like, use the old satellites basically until they fall out of the sky, right? They don't have to pull them yeah. out of the. So anything that's still there, that's really old but still working well. Yeah, they're just going to keep most of those up until they start generating errors, uh, and then they quickly retire them. Right. Because so, if they're if they're up, you know, the old ones, anything pre two F, I think it was anything before the two F series, I think they can't really do anything to firmware on the units. Mm -hmm. The two Fs and threes, I think were all somewhat firmware upgradable. And I assume some of that is uh, they don't want uh, hackers <laughs> to get access. Right. Not that I think they could, but you know, they yeah, want yeah. to ensure that should the worst happen, it could even be, Oops, someone uh, uh, typed the command wrong and took the entire billing servers online, uh, AWS. Uh, and you don't want to have right. a situation like that where you can't recover a satellite. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, they've got a bunch of safeties in there, I'm sure, for that. And part of it is to not have it completely firmware overwritable. You know. It's amazing to me. These things are floating up in space, you know, hundreds of miles above the Earth's surface. And we're talking about updating firmware and, you know, software to them. Like, you know, they're a, a Nintendo handheld game platform. Yeah, careful. You don't do that. It'll brick it. <laughs> oh, I just bricked a satellite. That might be bad. Now, the next uh, story that I dropped in here is really just so that uh, we could get yet another one of the uh, GNSS systems in here that we I don't think we've really mentioned much. And that's no, this the, is not GNSS. These are different initials. Well, yes, it is. But it's, it's one of those navigation ones. Uh, but Japan has their own very limited system. And this is a, a QZSS, a quasi-Zenith satellite system. And it's a regional one, which includes support for supplemental navigation. So it's not intended to, it's kind of, near as I can tell, kind of like WAS is in the U.S. The, you know, QZSS is to Japan. But Mitsubishi Heavy Industries uh, is launching, well, it had built the, uh, uh, satellites and then aerospace exploration agency japan aerospace Expo, you know, jaxa is their initials which i love uh launched this uh, second satellite on june 1st and the first of their satellites was launched back in september of 2010 wow so almost seven years to get a second one up there but these are you know just uh, supplemental systems and i did check out the uh, wikipedia article to kind of get a feel for what they're doing it, it was expected to have the system fully operational by 2013 according to the article oh boy that obviously hasn't happened since they just got the second satellite and it's supposed to be three to four satellites to do this so, it's, it, it's all from a little behind is it all from it's all for mobile i mean there it's not for gpsr right well, no, you. I don't think it will uh, affect GPSR, but it's targeted for the uh, mobile apps and it's really designed for communication-based services like video, data, and audio, according to the uh, information on Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. But it does include the uh, positioning information oh, as right. another one of its uh, services. Right. So positioning is you know, not one of its primary goals, but they're doing that to help improve the uh, accuracy. And it can't provide location on its own. So it's just a way to refine your uh, location. That's cool. All right. Last one that we're going to do in the main show, and then we've got to uh, jump off and get to our uh, patrons show. Uh, Gary, you want to read the uh, Patient Rock email? Sure. From Patient Rock. I've been playing the new geolocation game Garfield Go which is a baffling experience for many reasons. I'm left with so many questions, mainly why. Nevertheless, my question for the show is, if you could have a character, TV series, or movie get its own geolocation game, what would it be? 
I have one, but I don't know if you guys came up with one. All right. Well, Chris, why don't we let you go first? Well, do you have anything? You know, I'm thinking like uh, Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. where you're looking for um, uh, Inhumans. That would actually be a really good one that I hadn't uh, uh, considered. And we've been binging on the last season on Netflix right now. See, there you go. It's, uh, it would work, wouldn't it? Yeah, I really think that that one would. You could probably do something similar with uh, um, the DC's Legends uh, series as well, though. The Legends of Tomorrow? That That's really a bizarre series that I can't even watch. <laughs> we that, love that it. Deals more with time, though. That would be harder too. Yeah. Well, but I, I that would be one that would probably really be cool on uh, something like that AR kit. Oh yeah. You know, imagine th- uh, replacing buildings. Oh yeah. That mm-hmm. could you know put up statues of uh, future uh, you know like Captain the Trump's the Trump statue on the uh, mall in uh, Washington D.C. You can make it so that, like you said, it's sort of like futuristic, like what would happen yeah. in the game kind of thing. But if we actually, stop, if go if back we in stop time, this bad yeah, or back in time, this is yeah. what it'll look like. Yeah, yeah. Well, I would really love uh, uh, someone to do the AR kit where you could throw up uh, the. Well, that didn't sound right, but you put the buildings <laughs> up that used right. to be there back in like the 1920s or oh, the 1700s. Yeah. You know, cool. here's what the square looked like. You know, walk around the square. That would be a really cool use of the tech. That would Get be all up. those pictures from the smartphones from back in the day. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So exactly. You build the pictures properly. Yeah. Right. No. no. It, my thought uh, was instantly Princess Bride. Well, I love Princess Bride. Yeah. The rodents of unusual size. Yeah, you could have the rodents of unusual size. Like you could have the uh, battle of wits. You could do the uh, virtual sword fighting. Yeah, I Dr. could see 50. people in the park. Well, I could see people in the park like waving their phones around or something, you know, which would probably be a bad idea. But I thought that that could be and a of really course, fun you have one. To pay a visit to Miracle Max. Yes, of course. But then there's also, uh, you know, the uh, um, 007 series. I could see doing a whole series on that. Again, it's kind of like some of the other uh, stories that we've heard and seen. Uh, But what about doing uh, Austin Powers? Oh, I don't know if we could do a lot of that because, well, it wouldn't be family friendly. (laughs) You you could uh, tame it down enough. I think that would be uh, family friendly. It would not be necessarily tasteful, but it would be family friendly. (laughs) I thought cartoons, so I went Scooby-Doo. Rutro. Yeah, mm-hmm. I could see Scooby Doo. That would be a good one with the uh, mystery Brian fighting. Yeah, kind of a mystery series like a Who Done yeah. It. Well, and for that matter, I could even see uh, um, Disney getting into it with some of their mm-hmm. original properties, like uh, Mouse Detectives. Mm-hmm. Or the what was the other one? The Aristocats was that yeah, the other one where I they were like doing the crime Aristocats. fighting? Yeah, the Great Mouse Detective. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Getting into some of that kind of stuff would be uh, pretty cool. But with that, we're going to have to uh, wrap up this one because we're almost in an hour and it's uh, we, we got another show to do for our patrons after this. That yeah, I know. It's just we can talk about anything. But we've got uh, news from Wet Coaster about uh, changes in cell phone unlocking in Canada. We've got uh, word that the NFC chip in the iPhone is going to become available and new emojis. Plus a bunch of stuff from Team Mavigy that we're going to talk about in the after show. So we got a lot of stuff for the patrons. Uh, if you're not a patron and you can afford to uh, uh, give us a couple of bucks a month, and you know if you think we're worth a couple of bucks a month, you might want to head over to our uh, website, click on that Patreon link, and join the uh, Patreon program and get all of that good content. There's plenty of other content over there for free, though, that you don't have to pay for. So you know, head over there anyway and check some of that other stuff out. We have a whole list of shows coming up, though. Uh, of course, we always do, don't we, Chris? Always. <laughs> uh, Daryl, you work so hard at producing all or getting all these shows lined up. So you really deserve the credit. Well, thank you. Uh, and we've got 
just the four that we're going to tell you about right now. And next week, we're going to be talking with uh, Shermanator18 about uh, multi-device caching. We haven't talked about that one in a while, so better update that. Uh, then attending Megas and Gigas uh, with Memphis Mafia. So, you know, Gary, I figured yeah. we had to get you on so that we could get all three of you <laughs> on the show. It's perfect. You know, back to back. Just the 13th of July is going to be Road caching the chalk and for anyone who doesn't know he this guy gets around quite a bit and does a lot of caching boy on, does he i just saw him this weekend i think i'm gonna see him again this next upcoming weekend it, in one week he was in sweden and the next week he was going to be in uh, uh michigan caching with me and i ended up getting sick uh and then our uh, 27th show the last of july or show for the 27th is our 291st official show uh randomize licks so with a name like Licks, I figured we had to bring back Scott Burks, and he's going to try. We don't know for sure he's going to make it, but he's going to try to be on for a randomized Licks. And that's show 291. Just getting the bell ready for him. You, you got to get it ready because you know he's going to be using it. Until that point, make sure you check the Cashamaniacs website at cashamaniacs.com for more on the Geo Gearheads, including show notes from this and all of our episodes. We love hearing from our listeners, so leave us feedback by emailing geogearheads at cashamaniacs.com or through the many channels of social media. Your support helps keep the Cashamaniac shows coming, so please consider becoming a patron through the link on our website to support the Cashamaniac shows. Geo Gearheads is produced by Chris Umpenauer and Daryl Wattenberg. This show's copyright 2017 by Daryl Wattenberg. All rights reserved. Cash with the Cash of Media.